Welcome to Wonderland, the podcast where I go down the rabbit hole to research things you may be curious about. My name is Ami, and I'll be your guide on this trip to Wonderland. Hi there. Thanks for joining me today. It's the middle of December, and you're probably in the middle of holiday shopping, and as you're walking around crowded stores or surfing the web for the perfect gift for your loved ones, you might find yourself wondering about today's topic. Pirates. Shiver me timbers! Okay, so you probably weren't thinking about pirates prior to starting this episode. But I needed a topic for this episode, and thanks to suggestions on Facebook, this is it. So, now, are you wondering about pirates? I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. Hmm, I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. When you hear pirates... What do you think of? Giant up. Uh, I think of uh, the sea, you know, uh, freedom, and uh, the Black Pearl. Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes. It's the first thing that comes to mind. Ships. I guess I think of sailors that would take over other sailing vessels for profit. Oh, booty. Pirate booty. A pirate ship. How cool is the ship that they're on? Mm, Sailing the high seas. Swashbuckling. Rum. Me being a One Piece fan, I think of people who go and uh, go and steal treasure and so forth and so on. Like eye patches, yeah. peg legs, <laughs> parrots. Captain Jack Sparrow, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, for a while, you you know you had all different kind of games, movies, books, but Disney when they made the Pirates of the Caribbean. And they had that ride that almost like supplanted everything else as the standard for what you think pirates are. And Johnny Depp's character was just amazing. And everything that surrounded the, that movie and that world just kind of took over and became a life of its own. Whether you call them pirates, swashbucklers, marauders, buccaneers, corsairs, or something else entirely, Most people think of the nefarious sea folk plundering and pillaging boats on the sea. There are some common tropes with pirates, including eye patches, peg legs, parrots, and, of course, booty. The word pirate first appeared in English around 1300 and is derived from the Greek word pirates, which loosely translates to brigand and is applied to a variety of nautical misbehavior. Pirates are seafarers who board other ships or raid coastal towns with the intentions of stealing cargo and valuable goods. The worst of the pirates may also kidnap and murder as part of their pirating activities. And as long as there's water in a boat, it all kind of gets lumped in as piracy. It is often thought that pirates would take the treasures they stole and bury them in remote locations, which prompts the idea, romantic or otherwise, of treasure maps. In the interest of being in Wonderland, I want to talk a little about some of these common ideas surrounding pirates, and as we learn a little more about piracy and some famous pirates, we'll learn about where some of these tropes were born, so don't worry. But before we can start talking about some of the most famous historical and fictional pirates, we need to learn a little more about piracy itself. Let's start with, what is the difference between piracy and privateering? The legal system. Okay. Okay, maybe. Maybe. Is privateering kind of like being a mercenary, sort of, where somebody is paying you to steal from other people for them, and then piracy is just straight up theft, because you want it for yourself? Um, I have no clue. Let's say, looks like a wild guess. I would imagine that the, I don't know, I guess the regular pirates are pirating, and then the upper pirate is the privateer privateering was sort of condoned by i'll say the english uh, as long as it wasn't against the crown where piracy is uh considered illegal by any government i guess uh, i think it's whether you're recognized or not by uh some form of, of country right like uh, a privateer is someone hired by the english or the the Spanish during that time, whereas pirates were kind of independent on their ship, ransacking privateers or, or government ships. I think when it's piracy, it's kind of no holds bar. You're going to kill Pluton and Lunder when privateering may be more of like mercenary work. I believe they were very close, <laughs> but the 
Well, maybe they were hired by the British government. Okay, piracy is stealing for your own uh, benefit. Privateering is what government pays you to do. In a very broad sense, Jenny was pretty spot on when she reduced pirates to <laughs> sea criminals. Although James Davy, curator of naval history at Royal Museums Greenwich, asserts that most pirates didn't set out to be criminals. There is this idea that pirates were swashbuckling legendary figures, or on the other hand, they were these evil, brutish people. James Davy, curator of naval history at Royal Museums Greenwich. And like most caricatures, they have only some basis in reality. The vast majority of pirates were ordinary people, often merchants who were forced into criminal activity to make ends meet. Privateers, however, well, they weren't criminals at all because they had papers from their government allowing them to carry out quasi-military activities. So this license to attack an enemy nation's merchant shipping could be very lucrative. And as Britain's ambitions grew wider, this license became formalized as a letter of mark and defined you as a privateer. If you don't have a license, you're a pirate. If you do have a license, you're a privateer. They sailed in privately owned ships and robbed merchant vessels and pillaged seaside settlements of rival countries, all in the name of their own country. Admittedly, the lines between piracy and privateering could become blurred, with privateers sometimes working outside of their written commission, though with the encouragement of a government. Only the activities outlined in their commissions were protected, regardless of how fervently they may have been encouraged to engage in extracurricular piracy. One of the most famous privateers was Sir Francis Drake, an English admiral who made a fortune plundering Spanish settlements in the Americas after being granted a privateering commission by Elizabeth I in 1572. Fun random information I found while down this rabbit hole. BBC reports that Drake was the first person from England to circumnavigate the globe, albeit an unintentional byproduct of raiding Spanish ships. To England, Drake was a well-respected privateer. But to Spain, Drake, dubbed El Drac, was a menacing pirate. To English people, he was a hero. The word pirate would never have been used, but to people in Spain and across the Mediterranean, he was El Draco, the most famous and notorious pirate of the age. And because I mentioned earlier some of the other terms for pirates, I'm going to give a quick overview of buccaneers, corsairs, and swashbucklers. Buccaneers were a type of privateer particular to the Caribbean Sea. The term buccaneer is derived from the Caribbean word bucan, and refers to a wooden frame on which meat is slowly roasted. The word was adopted into French, and the people who slow roasted their meat into jerky were called boucaniers. The boucaniers sold their jerky to corsairs and privateers, and eventually they themselves transitioned to full-time piracy in an attempt to keep the Spanish from wiping them and their prey animals out. Corsairs were typically separated into two camps. Barbary Corsairs, who were mainly Muslim pirates and privateers who operated from the Barbary coast of central and western North Africa. The other is French Corsairs, who were French privateers who seized vessels. French Corsairs are the pirates or privateers who gained the swashbuckler reputation, with their sword biting and romantic and flamboyant portrayals common in literature. So we know that pirates were terrorizing the seas in the 1500s. But when or where do you think the first documented pirates were? When and where? How about along the East Indian Trading Company route somewhere in 1643? Well, I know there was something with like the Spanish Armada uh, and the English Navy. So I would, I would say, I don't know, like the 1600s, the 1500s. Uh, there, there's a date somewhere in there where the Spanish Armada failed. Um yeah, so I'd say somewhere in the 15, 1600s. I would guess probably in the 15 or 1600s, but I think that they weren't necessarily considered to be pirates then. They were privateers that were hired by their um, home governments or by governments to loot and whatnot of their enemies. Uh, here's the funny thing. I, I don't know. I want to say maybe in the 1400s when the Chinese had their treasure fleets, you probably had pirates who were trying to take uh, take down some of those fleets, but I honestly don't know. Probably sometime, probably be sometime in the BC era when the Celts or the tribes of Egypt and whatnot were 
were around. I believe that many of them came from Scotland, but then, you know, they uh, they had a pretty democratic uh, way of uh, living. <laughs> so then, you know, other people joined their ranks. Oh, and, and they also, uh, I think Britain actually uh, used them. Oh, I think piracy has been around in B.C. era since people had boats. When most people invoke images of pirates, it's common to hearken to a time of great sea exploration during the 14 and 1500s. But certainly sea bandits have existed long before then. The earliest documented instances of piracy are the exploits of the sea people of the Aegean and the Mediterranean seas as far back as 14th century B.C. In classical antiquity, the Illyrians and Phoenicians would also be known as pirates. Classic texts such as Homer's Iliad and Odyssey depict piracy, and ancient Greeks actually condoned piracy as a viable profession. Then, during the Middle Ages, you have the rise of Vikings. You think Vikings are pirates? I hadn't thought of Vikings as pirates, but I guess they could be. That's not a question. I was just curious. Oh. And honestly, would Vikings be considered pirates? I, I just, it's very weird how, like, what would be considered a pirate and what is the actual definition of what a pirate is, because we have a we have a made-up idea of what a pirate is, but I'm quite sure academically the definition is something totally different from what we imagine. In your opinion, are Vikings pirates? No. I would say no, too. I don't, they're not piratey to me. Mm-mm. I don't think, patches. right, and <laughs> parrots <Peg legs>. and <laughs> peg legs. These seaborne Scandinavian warriors raided and looted coasts, rivers, and inland cities all over Western Europe and down to the northern parts of Africa between the 8th and 12th centuries. Piracy wasn't limited to the Atlantic or to the Corsairs in the Mediterranean either. There are documented accounts of piracy in Asia between 251 and 865 AD, and it was an act of piracy that was responsible for the Umayyad conquest of Sindh in 711 AD. But while piracy has been around for centuries, there's a reason why people think of the pirates in the Atlantic and Caribbean in the 16 and 1700s. Thousands of pirates were active during this period, a time known as the golden age of piracy. What constitutes the golden age of piracy? I'd almost be tempted to say now. Why is that? Well, you could you could say that even now because there is modern day piracy off of uh, Africa on the Indian Ocean. Golden age of piracy was probably somewhere around the 1500s. The golden age of piracy was during the 16, 1600s. All the way maybe to the 1800s. Oh man, will this, will this be probably like in the 8, 17, 1800s? 1700s? Uh, prior to the discovery of the New World, once the world started uh, being completely found, I feel like piracy started shrinking a little bit. Although, I guess Somalia, right? Uh, is this today a golden age of pirates? No. Um, yeah, I'd say the same time, probably the 1600s. When, when, when was like. Um... What's his face coming to America? Seventeen seventy. I want to say yeah, 1776. That's, that's not right. That's fourteen forty two. Yes, that was the. 14, that's where you saw the coast. Hundred ninety. Fourteen hundred ninety. Yeah, the I'm going to say it was around in the fourteen hundreds, around when that was going. She on. She said fourteen ninety two. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that very year. <laughs> that same. I believe it was around the time, or after, just after, not too long. Uh, that America was formed? Uh, another great question. I'm not sure. Uh, again, I'm, I want to, everybody keeps thinking during the Caribbean, during the, what, the 1500s or the 1600s, uh, when the new world was discovered and everybody was in a race to get here. But I mean, we know that China ruled the, the known world at the time and had these huge fleets around uh, what, and during their dynasty eras, so it's very hard to say. The time period between the mid 1600s and mid 1700s is often designated the golden age of piracy and is where most modern conceptions of piracy are born. Some historians divide the golden age of piracy into three periods. The first is the buccaneering period between about 1650 and 1680, which is characterized by Anglo-French seamen in Jamaica and Tortuga attacking Spanish colonies and Caribbean shipping. The second is the pirate round, 
in the 1690s, which is associated with long-distance voyages from the Americas to rob Muslim and East India Company targets in the Indian Ocean. And the third, which is truly the heart of the Golden Age, was between 1715 and 1726, during the post-Spanish succession period, when Anglo-American sailors and privateers became unemployed following the end of the War of the Spanish Succession and turned en masse to piracy in the Caribbean Sea, the Indian Ocean, the North American seaboard, and the West African coast. The first known literary mention of a golden age of piracy is in 1894, when an English journalist by the name of George Powell used the phrase while reviewing Charles Leslie's A New and Exact History of Jamaica, when he describes, quote, what appears to have been the golden age of piracy up to the last decade of the 17th century. But it was in 1897 when historian John Fisk leveraged the phrase when he wrote, At no other time in world's history has the business of piracy thriven so greatly as the 17th century and the first part of the 18th. Its golden age may be said to have extended from about 1650 to about 1720. This concluded that the activities of the Barbary Corsairs and East Asian pirates, noting that as these Muslim pirates and those of Eastern Asia were as busily at work in the 17th century as at any other time, their case does not impair my statement that the age of the buccaneers was the golden age of piracy. Piracy continued past this golden age and still continues today. Today, we most frequently hear about Somali pirates. Piracy in the Indian Ocean has been a threat to international shipping since the beginning of the Somali Civil War in the early 1990s. According to Oceans Beyond Piracy, OBP, piracy in the area, along with increased shipping expenses, cost an estimated $6.6 to $6.9 billion annually. Additionally, the German Institute for Economic Research has indicated that profiteers arose around the piracy with insurance companies significantly increasing their profits as a result of hiking rate premiums in response. And, uh, and then, of course, you have to look at the Somalian pirates that, that literally yeah. take over like these Maersk uh, ships, and they're doing it not necessarily for what's on the ship, but for the fact that the hostages, they get ransomed. And yeah. Like Maersk alone, I think, has a budgetary like setup for uh, millions, like millions and millions every year just to pay the ransoms to these Somalian pirates. So, and did you, and did you see they cleaned it up and now it's on the other side of Africa? Oh, is it on the the uh, pi- the, the, the western yeah. side? Yeah, they moved. Boy. It's basically the pirate operation. They were talking about it when they were talking about uh, the war with. Israel and how Iran. So now the Horn, was it the Horn of Hamus? What I'm trying to remember, but basically that whole corridor in the Middle East has pirates have started popping up there, and now they're talking about pirates on the other side of Africa, where they've shut down all the the African pirates before, and now they're back again, just on the other side of the continent. In the 21st century, there have been a dozen or so notable occurrences of piracy with the most recent occurring just this past November. In November of 2023, during the Israel-Hamas War, a tanker ship owned by Zodiac Maritime was attacked in the Gulf of Aden by suspected Somali pirates. The crew of the USS Mason came to the ship's assistance and captured five of the pirates. Tensions are high in the region after the Pentagon says a U.S. Navy ship saved an Israeli-linked oil tanker from pirates. The military says ballistic missiles were fired from Yemen toward the USS Mason after that Navy ship stopped armed pirates from seizing the tanker in the Gulf of Aden. And speaking of capturing pirates, certainly there's got to be legislation regarding these criminal acts. So are there laws about piracy? When were they written? What do you think they entail? I think that there might have been because I guess about the same time that the pirates were, you know, taking over ships. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, that was against the law for sure. Is it still? Yes. Punchable by? Death. Really? Yes. <laughs> they were written in the 15 or 1400s that any person that commits piracy was hung or uh, sent to the gallows to... I imagine there's probably some international laws against piracy, and I would have to suspect that piracy can be uh, 
as far as punishment could be anything up to death. I would imagine that piracy laws have been being written since the, the I guess, the first documented cases of piracy. Um, based on popular culture, piracy, the if you were convicted of piracy, I thought it was death, but I could be wrong, but that's just based on popular culture and what we've seen in television and movies. And I'm quite sure there's some laws written about I it. I think there is. International. Yeah. Yeah. Piracy laws. But I don't know. I guess you go to see jail. Davy Jen's locker. <laughs> if you're caught. When? When do you think? You want to stick with 1492? Again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. We're, we're kind of a little more current. Um, I'm going to say maybe. I don't know. I really. Uh, 1940s. Okay. Or 1493. <laughs> the next year after the golden year of piracy. I would imagine they have to. They have to govern it some way, right? Ooh, man. So usually I, I, I'm just going to go off of normally how things would go, period. Usually there, I wouldn't necessarily say when the time was, but when everything was getting hectic and they were just doing a bunch of craziness and they had to figure out a way to organize it and govern it. That's the, the best that I can say. I know that is like the dumbest answer ever, but. Uh, laws about piracy, I'm sure there is something. Uh, you know, the East India Trading Company certainly did not like pirates, at least pirates of the Caribbean would lead us to believe that. Uh, so I'm sure there are laws that talk about not, you know, stealing or plundering. Oh, oh, hanging for sure. A short drop and a sudden stop. Um, I'm public hangings for, for, you know, ransacking villages or you know plundering um i don't think they would have like locked you up forever for it type thing i think they would have just gone with the the public trial of execution back at you know the golden age of the if you're thinking 1500s 1600s for sure that'd be my guess i don't know i had a harder time tracking this down than i would have thought first as we discussed a privateer to one country is a pirate to another we spoke about the Spanish and English as it pertains to this, but similar instances have occurred here in the United States, with Jefferson Davis issuing letters of mark to Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. President Lincoln, in response, issued Proclamation 81, declaring a blockade of ports in rebellious states, which basically said that the Union didn't recognize the Confederacy as a legitimate country, and therefore anyone acting under these marks would be considered pirates and sentenced accordingly. The accordingly I speak of is based on piracy laws put in place by the first Congress in 1790 that provided that if any citizen shall commit any piracy or robbery aforesaid or any act of hostility against the United States or any citizen thereof upon the high sea under color of any commission from any foreign prince or state or on pretense of authority from any person such offender shall, notwithstanding the pretense of any such authority, be deemed, adjudged, and taken to be a pirate, felon, or robber, and on being thereof convicted shall suffer death. Even before then, the English Parliament issued the Piracy Act in 1698, which was making some changes to the previously passed Offenses at Sea Act of 1536. The act allowed for acts of piracy to be examined, inquired of, heard and determined, and adjudged in any place at sea or upon the land, in any of His Majesty's islands, plantations, colonies, dominions, forts, or factories, essentially enabling admirals to hold court wherever they were to try pirates, rather than requiring that the trial be held in England. They allowed for the admiral to carry out sentencing, which included suffering the pains of death. The earliest example I could find of codifying maritime law was the Rhodian Sea Laws from around 800 or 900 BC in ancient Greece. These laws were later adopted by the Roman and Byzantine empires. The Catholic Church condemned piracy in the Third Lateran Council in 1179 and placed pirates under penalty of excommunication, but only if their crimes were committed against Christians. Add to all of this the entire concept of international waters and the lack of jurisdiction any country has there. We've all had that conversation about once you get in international waters, you can do whatever you want. So I honestly, I don't know. That's one side of the law. Unless you live in that world and culture, you don't really know about. I found a paper by Michael J. Kelly called 
the prehistory of piracy as a crime and its definitional odyssey. From 2013, in which Kelly discusses at one point that the criminal jurisdictions stems not from who one is, but more accurately, what they have done. He quotes International Criminal Law, Volume 2, saying that, quote, application of universal jurisdiction is predicated largely on the notion that some crimes are so heinous that they offend the interest of all humanity, and indeed imperil civilization itself. He then goes on to state that piracy has long been considered the grandfather of universal crimes. As such, any state anywhere in the world can prosecute a pirate, even if that state has no connection whatsoever to the underlying acts that the defendant has committed. He further asserts that the original rationale for universal jurisdiction over pirates sprang forth due to the location of the crime, the high seas, where no state had jurisdiction extending from its coastal waters into the common areas of the high seas, so every state was granted jurisdiction over pirates, if they could catch them. The concept of universal jurisdiction is reflected in the Rhodian Sea Laws I discussed, as well as in the rules of Oleron in the 12th century. Gentili in 1552 to 1608 was the first of the early modern jurists to argue that piracy was forbidden under the law of nations, which is to say, public international law. Pirates have been tried for centuries, and initially, punishment for piracy was death. The murky laws around piracy, and really defining piracy legally, has meant that while pirates still exist today, trials for piracy are not common. The U.S. Supreme Court heard a piracy case in 1820 in the United States versus Smith, and then didn't hear another piracy case until August of 2010. Now that we've discussed what piracy is, when it flourished, and what the penalties were for piracy, let's talk about some of the pirates who gave life to the legends. Who were some famous pirates? Blackbeard, the ones they talk about on Oak Island all the time. Captain Hook. Well, Captain Hook was a real captain. I literally just watched a uh, expedition unknown where it was a Spanish pirate. And for the life of me, it was a great episode. He even fought with Captain Blackbeard and, and mm -hmm. Captain Kid. Uh, but I can't. Arpeo, I think his name, Captain Arpeo, yeah. works pirate. Long John Silver. Um, Davy Jones. Hedwig Pete. Redbeard, for sure. Uh, Blackbeard. And of course, uh, Captain Jack Sparrow. Uh, Johnny Depp. <laughs> in the Pirates of the Caribbean, what's his name in that movie? Jack Sparrow and Captain Hook. I will say Captain Hook. Let's go with that. Dustin Hoff. Blackbeard. Uh, Captain Kidd. Uh, Edward Teach, a.k.a. Blackbeard. Um, the Gentleman Pirate. I can't remember his real name now. Um, Sneed. Captain Hook. Jack Sparrow. Captain Cook, I think, <laughs> and uh, Captain Jack Sparrow. He might have only been in a movie, though. The biggest one that comes to mind is Blackbeard. I know there are more. Uh, I've actually read a few comics on pirates, but right now that's the one that everybody knows and everybody remembers. It's funny because it's like I, I, there's a documentary about like pirates when cap when the pirates of the caribbean came out and everybody was all <laughs> pirates and they were like hey calm down they weren't great people and, and it was like and i remember and they talked about the this one uh female captain pirate and i was just like blown away and not to this day i cannot remember anything else about except for like the voyages and the runs and how big they were on this side of the world and and in the caribbean and it was just like i I cannot remember anything about it, but I can tell you everything about the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. And I'm just like. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start with good old Captain Jack Sparrow. Savvy. Despite the fact that he's definitely a fictional character. Although the eccentric pirate character created by Disney and brought to life by Johnny Depp isn't a real pirate. This character definitely appears to have some basis on a real life pirate. One John Ward in the 16th century. John Ward was born in the mid-1550s to a poor family, and it's reported that he was, quote, an out-and-out -out steel who spent much of his time getting drunk. He would sit melancholy, speak doggedly, and repine at other men's good fortunes. Ward was a privateer during the time that Elizabeth I was issuing licenses to anyone intending to plunder Spanish ships. He found some successes, but then, when James VI and I succeeded the crown and banned all privateering expeditions, Ward became unemployed. He lamented, where are the days that have been 
when we might sing, swear, drink, drab, and kill men as freely as your cake makers do flies. He turned to a life of piracy after hearing of a Catholic merchant ship moving from England to France and convinced 30 other men to seize the vessel and its treasure. Only, the owner of the ship had actually learned of the plot, and so no treasure was aboard. But then, while off the Isle of Sicily, his men spotted a French merchant ship. Ward pretended to be friendly, giving the sign of friendship, and passing many hours in courteous discourse with the captain, before raising his piratical battle cry and overtaking the ship and crew. As Ward's successes grew, so did his sense of style, and he was reported to be quite flamboyant, wearing only the finest clothing. He was also known for his very eccentric behavior and was nicknamed Sparrow. Just as many people know who Captain Jack Sparrow is, one of the most well-known pirates is Blackbeard. Edward Teach, Blackbeard, is the most notorious pirate in history. Blackbeard's real name was Edward Teach, or Thatch. These two names are used somewhat interchangeably. Teach was born around 1680 and lived until 1718. He was an English pirate who operated around the West Indies and eastern coast of Britain's North American colonies. It is thought that he may have originally been a sailor on privateer ships before settling in the Bahamas. Teach renamed a French slave ship he captured from La Concorde to Queen Anne's Revenge, equipping her with 40 guns and over 300 men. His name, Blackbeard, came from the fact that he had a big, thick, black beard, which he reportedly placed firecrackers in when overtaking other ships. It is reported that Blackbeard, though very feared in reputation, actually never killed anyone until his final battle, which ultimately resulted in his own death. It is reported he was shot five times and cut about 20. His head was severed from his body and suspended from the bow of his killer's slew, and his body was thrown in the inlet. When his killer returned to Virginia to collect a reward that had been placed on Blackbeard, Blackbeard's head was placed on a pole at the entrance to Chesapeake Bay as a warning to other pirates and stayed there for several years. As a note, Smithsonian Magazine published an article in November of 2018 that paints a much different picture of the notorious scary pirate. I'll link it on the website, so be sure to check it out to learn more about a kindler, gentler Blackbeard. In keeping with pirates who earn their names based on the color of their facial hair. Red beard, black beard, yeah, long beard, <laughs> long beard, short beard, <laughs> all the beards. The beards are done, yeah. Mm. We'll talk next about Redbeard. Redbeard, or Barbarossa, which is Italian for Redbeard, went by many different names during his pirating career, including Kadir, Hayreddin Pasha, the Pirate of Algiers, and even the King of the Sea. But the name Barbarossa is what many would call him and his brother in the late 1400s and early 1500s. The Barbarossa brothers, who originally worked in the Mediterranean, fled to North Africa in 1512 after a succession fight in the Ottoman Empire. They rose to prominence by preying on Spanish and Portuguese ships as independent corsairs. Eventually, one brother died battling the Spanish in 1518, and the other brother assumed the Barbarossa identity and continued the fight, enlisting help from the Ottoman Empire. Barbarossa became an admiral-in-chief with the Ottoman Empire, fighting his most famous battle in Greece, which opened Tripoli in the eastern Mediterranean to Ottoman rule. Another famous pirate whose name was based on appearance is a fictional pirate by the name of Captain James Hook. Now let's give him a very big aim, because he's only got one. <laughs> I give you the steel and stingray, Captain James Hook! The nemesis to J.M. Barry's Peter Pan. In the story, Captain Hook's right hand is made of iron due to Peter Pan cutting off his actual hand during a duel and feeding it to a crocodile. Hook is depicted as both a gentleman and a villain. And while many have tried to determine who Barry's Hook was based on, Barry never indicated any specific muse for the character. Some people believe that perhaps Hook was based on real-life English captain and privateer Christopher Newport, who notably was also missing his right hand. Newport boarded an enemy ship off of the coast of Cuba and during the battle lost his arm and shockingly replaced it with a hook. Fun fact, despite Captain Hook's right hand being the missing hand, much like Newport's, in film it's usually depicted as the left hand due to the difficulty in completing tasks with the non-dominant hand. Another real-life individual who some historians surmise may have inspired Hook was an 18th century navigator and explorer by the name of Captain James Cook. Mostly, this is due to the similarity in names. 
Another fictional character who many folks think of when they think of pirates is Robert Louis Stevenson's Long John Silver, the main antagonist in his 1883 novel, Treasure Island. This character, specifically, is responsible for some of the most common tropes in pirate personification, such as missing legs and pet parrots. Silver's parrot is named Captain Flint, and he says things like, Pieces of eight, and stand by and go about. In the novel, Silver claims to have lost his left leg under the immortal hawk while serving in the Royal Navy. The character has been portrayed throughout history in film and in television, but also has had video game characters adapted after him, such as Johnny Silverhand in Cyberpunk 2077. Rock band Jefferson Airplane called their 1792 album Long John Silver. And of course, you're probably familiar with the fast food seafood chain, Long John Silver's. Long John Silver. We give you lots of reasons to love us. While Silver is a fictional character, I did learn that parrots aboard the ship actually may have been a somewhat common occurrence. It turns out that it wasn't unusual for animals to be aboard the ships that were raided by pirates, and an exotic talking bird would have been amusing to cruise, but also much less of a liability to feed and care for than other animals. So it's likely that when these birds were looted, that the pirates probably did keep them. You sailor. Cotton, sir. Mr. Cotton. Do you have the courage and fortitude to follow orders and stay true in the face of danger and almost certain death? Mr. Cotton! Answer, man. He's a mute, sir. Poor devil had his tongue cut out. So he trained the parrot to talk for him. No one yet figured how. Mr. Cotton's parrot. Same question. Ah, we need a sail! We need a sail! Mostly we figure that means yes. Of course it does. And Silver wasn't described as wearing an eye patch, but the mascot for the seafood chain is depicted with an eye patch. I did some research, and it looks like this trope is likely an overplayed fictional aspect of a pirate's overall look. Interestingly, however, while researching this, I learned that there's a theory that maybe pirates wore eye patches not due to injury, but to aid their vision during battles. The thought is that when they boarded another ship and went below deck, that their eyes would need to adjust, losing them valuable time during the attack. The theory is that the eye patch over one eye means that one eye would be adjusted to the sunlight above deck and the other used to darkness. When they went below deck, they'd remove the eye patch and be able to see. Mythbusters apparently did an episode on this in 2007 and ruled the myth plausible after their test. But while it's plausible, pirate historian Dr. Rebecca Simpson told IFL Science that it's unlikely. She is quoted as saying, there is no evidence that pirates wore eye patches. There are no images, woodcuts, or any mentions of them in any primary sources from the 17th and 18th centuries. So, it's a fun theory, but likely not one rooted in fact. Another pirate trope that is very popular is the concept of buried treasure. I learned that largely this just didn't happen. Robert Blythe, and I'm senior curator of world and maritime history. Did pirates bury their treasure? Pirates buried their treasure only if they really, really had to. Burying pirate treasure would be a really risky thing to do. You might be overseen or you might not get back to where your treasure had been buried. So it would be a high risk activity. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, all, it's all really myth you know, the lost treasure of Pirate X or Pirate Y, and um, they just don't get found, which rather suggests that they're not, in fact, there in the first place. Whereas, you know, a Roman hoard or something that is dug up, and they do happen fairly regularly, why don't we keep finding pirate hoards, which suggests that they might not really be there. There is one very notable exception, and that's with a pirate known as Captain Kidd. Captain William Kidd was born around 1654 and died May 23, 1701. He was a Scottish privateer commissioned to protect English interest in North America and the West Indies. It is believed that Kidd buried at least part of his wealth on Gardner's Island near Long Island before sailing into New York City, where he was wanted as a pirate. He hoped to use knowledge of his hidden treasure as a bargaining chip to keep him from being executed. Kidd was taken to stand trial before the High Court of Admiralty in London, where he was tried and convicted for murder and five counts of piracy. He was sentenced to public execution on May 23, 1701, and had to be hanged twice. On the first attempt, the rope broke and Kidd survived, only to be hung a second time ten minutes later. His body was gibbeted over the River Thames as a warning to future would-be pirates for three years. 
The story of Kidd's hidden treasure has inspired numerous treasure hunts conducted on Oak Island, Nova Scotia, and Suffolk County, Long Island, where Gardner's Island is located, as well as several islands in Connecticut, Charles Island, the Thimble Islands, and Cockanoe Island. A small cache of treasure was found on Gardner's Island in a spot known as Cherry Tree Field, and the governor at the time sent it to England to be used against Kidd in his trial. Before we go on to talk about two more pirates, I do want to talk about another piece of pirate lore, and that is the Jolly Roger. Do you know what the Jolly Roger is? Oh, it's candy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's a popular hard candy called a Jolly Rancher. Uh, is that Blackbeard's ship? I don't think it was a ship. <laughs> uh, that was a famous pirate's boat. Is that a ship? Oh, that's the most famous pirate ship. It's funny because for those of us who were anime nerds from back in the day, that was the name of Roy Fulker's Veritech fighter, the Jolly Roger. It had had the pirate flag, uh, the skull and crossbones. That's that symbol we all know. Ooh, technically you're not wrong. While the Jolly Roger isn't usually known as a boat, Captain Hook's fictional boat was called the Jolly Roger. Half point for you. The Jolly Roger is the flag that they fly. The Jolly Roger is uh, the popular pirate flag that you all think of with the, the skull and the uh, the crossbones or the sword crossing behind it. The skull and crossbones, the, the flag that is flown by the pirates. What's it for? Uh, intimidation. <laughs> and it also lets them know who these pirates are. Why do you think they went with skull and crossbones? Like, why is that the universal one? It's probably because it's scary. But they're not all skull and, skull and crossbones either. What else do you know? I know Edward Teach Blackbeard had a skeleton holding a spear and like a heart. And that's how you would know that was him. Yes, this is it. Jolly Roger is the traditional English name for the flags flown to identify a pirate ship preceding or during an attack during the early 18th century. The flag most commonly identified as the Jolly Roger today is a black flag with a skull and crossed bones. It was used by a number of pirate captains, including Black Sam Bellamy, Edward England, and John Taylor. The Allen Maritime Museum in Finland has one of only two known authentic Jolly Rogers remaining in the world today on display. The term Jolly Roger has been documented at least as far back as 1724, when Charles Johnson detailed it in his A General History of Pirates. He cited two pirates who named their flag Jolly Roger, Bartholomew Roberts and Francis Spriggs. While they called them the same name, their designs were different from one another, suggesting that Jolly Roger was a generic term for black pirate flags. Neither Roberts nor Spriggs design included a skull or crossbones. Some historians believed that the name may have been derived from the French phrase Jolie Rouge, meaning pretty red, potentially symbolizing blood and violence. Regardless of the design of the Jolly Roger, it was intimidating for an opposing ship to see it on the horizon. There are several iterations of the Jolly Roger, and I'll link a few graphics and the pirate to whom they were attributed on the website if you'd like to go further down this rabbit hole. And now, the last two pirates we're going to talk about. Leroy mentioned that he watched a documentary in which a female pirate was featured. I'm not sure which documentary he was watching, but I'm going to take a stab and say he may have been referencing Anne Bonny or Mary Reed both of whom were part of Calico Jack Rackham's crew in the late 16 and early 1700s. Anne Bonny was the daughter of a plantation owner in South Carolina who left her life behind for the Caribbean in early 1700s, disguising herself as a man on the ship of a pardoned buccaneer, Calico Jack Rackham. Bonny's partner, Mary Reed, was working on another ship when it was captured by Rackham, so she joined his crew, also dressed as a man. Bonnie and Reed became friends and pillaged the high seeds together. They wore jackets and pants and fought with a machete in one hand and a pistol in the other. A victim of their piracy testified that they were willing to do anything. When Rackham's ship and crew were captured off Jamaica in 1720 and put on trial, Bonnie and Reed avoided the gallows because they were both pregnant. Reed died in prison with a fever, and Bonnie survived, being returned to her father in South Carolina, where she lived until she was 84. While these are the two most well-known female pirates, they are certainly not the only ones. I'm going to link some information on the pirate queen Ching Shi, a Chinese pirate who controlled a fleet of 1,200 ships and around 70,000 pirates in the early 1800s. We're nearing the end of this rabbit hole, but I don't really feel like we can talk about pirates without talking about sea shanties. Do you know any sea shanties? 
No, I do not. Do you really not? I do not. None. I do not know any sea shanties. You can't sing me a sea shanty. I don't know any sea shanties. Not one. I do not know any sea shanties. <laughs> okay. Yes, and I refuse to sing them. I also was in the Navy, and we had quite a few songs, but I do believe in 2023, I'm not allowed to sing any of those. If I promised you wouldn't get canceled, could you sing a little bit of one of them? No. There's always a microphone. All right. All right, Amelia. I tried. <laughs> oh, what is a sea shanty? Like a little tune. A little... Like, oh, how about um, Sally sold seashells? Is that the same? <gasps> like, uh, what do you do with a drunk one? That's the one I was trying to think of. So, that one. SpongeBob Square. <laughs> um, uh, for a while during the pandemic, I was, I was into them. I can't think of their names or anything, but uh, Will Ferrell does a good one and the other guy. Yes, I do. Uh, I can sing parts of them, yes. I don't have them memorized. Um, yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. That's going to be the only one that I know. Yes. Do you want me to sing it? I kind of do, but there's like people doing work. I'll do it. Okay. What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor early in the morning? Throw her in the brig with the captain's daughter. Throw him in the brig with the captain's daughter. (laughs) Pirates, their sea shanties, and high sea adventures, glamorized or not, have inspired a litany of pop culture. But it's the one that Disney does. A black, about black uh, Captain Jack Sparrow. Uh, Captain Hook. Oh, yeah. God, I forgot him. Yeah, it's the, I think the one that just really makes the biggest impression is the Caribbean. But I do watch, what is it? The um, uh, Expedition X, or not X, uh, Unknown. And he has a lot, uh, many programs on uh, pirates and hunting for treasure. Pirates of the Caribbean 1. Uh, treasure Island. Uh, the Muppets Treasure Island. Uh, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, of course. Everyone's going to say that one. Uh, Treasure Island's like Space Pirates. The other Treasure Island, the one, the space one. Treasure Planet. Treasure Planet, that's it. Treasure <laughs> Planet. <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean 2. Okay, Pirates of the Caribbean. And there was a TV series, and for the sake of me, I've been sitting here the whole time trying to remember it. It had all the characters in it. On oh, this treasure island? No. <laughs> is the Swiss Family Robinson a piratey thing? I thought they were stranded on an island. Or is that it? No, I'm not going to be able to think of the name of it. Watched <gasps> oh, it on the Netflix. Oh, the Goonies. Black Flag? I don't know. There's been another, though. Treasure Island? Yes. Ooh. Hook. <laughs> Peter Pan. Oh. SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Pirates of the Caribbean 3. Oh, we've we've hit on Pirates of the Caribbean a couple of times in this conversation already. Uh, Peter Pan, right? Uh, they've got pirates in that. Um, I feel like we're missing a lot here. Um, I mean, I feel like a lot of Blackbeard and Redbeard has been just popularized by uh, by cinema or by by books. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, I can't think of any others. But yeah, I'm, I know there's probably tons of books out Pirates there. of the Caribbean 4. Well, I don't know too many, but Pirates of the Caribbean and Captain Hook are the two ones that I know the most. Pirates of the Caribbean 5. Pirates of the Caribbean, the, of course, One Piece, which I watch. Um, let's see. Uh, Sinbad the Sailor. And to be released in 2024, Pirates of the Caribbean 6. Um... Right now, of course, Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, Disney made a, a, a fortune on that. Uh, Ubisoft has made a one of their best Assassin's Creed games uh, called Black Flag, came out on the PS3. There is a couple of video games. Ubisoft is taking that idea of Black Flag and the whole pirate stuff that they had in that game, turned it into another game called Skull and Bones. And then there's another video game called Monkey Island. Uh, or no sea of thieves that's what it's called sea of thieves and uh one of the expansions is monkey island i'm sure we've all wondered while watching these pirate movies and shows just what we would do if we were on a ship being boarded by pirates so i asked some people just that me you on a vessel Mm -hmm. boarded by pirates right 
Well, I guess I'd have to question what mistakes I made to be on a vessel that's being boarded by pirates. Like if you're on a Disney cruise or something, and all of a sudden it got boarded by pirates. I would probably do exactly as I was told. By the pirates? Or the security on the boat. Yeah, some whoever. Like, <laughs> would I United 93 it? No. You're on a <laughs> boat. I would do what they told me to do. So they wouldn't make me walk the plank. <laughs> I would probably defend myself from the pirates. Hide. I mean, at that point, you just have to fight to the death, right? You you swashbuckle a little bit. You get out your sword, um, or you. Uh, I, I don't think uh, you have time to stock up your musket. So yeah, I think you just you know get into a sword fight to the death. I'm not thinking I would beat a pirate, but you know, uh, you go down valiantly. I would get in the pirate boat since they're already on my boat and sail away and leave them with my boat. There you go. What if you had a really nice boat? I'd be so sad, but I'd be alive. Figure out a way to become one. Because <laughs> I figure if I join them, then I don't have to beat them. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I would just become a pirate. What if it wasn't your boat? What if you're on a Disney cruise and then the pirates came though and they wanted all of your pearls? They can have them. I guess they. I guess they're getting them as long as they take get me home. You know, don't just like <laughs> just, just drop me off me away. Man. Yeah, you can have whatever. Don't I'll, throw me over. Don't make me walk the plank. Brandish my sword and fight. You would have a sword. Are you talking about modern day? Yeah, yeah. yeah like if you're just like on a oh. Disney cruise and oh. <laughs> I'd run until I found something suitable to defend myself with. That's a good one because when I was in the navy, we did a boarding party raids where we would like defend the ship against raiders. And I remember one time we did one with the Navy SEALs or, and we did one with like, like different groups. We lost every time, like we lost the ship. Um, I don't remember a time where we won. So the fight or flight in you says, yeah, I would fight. But then when you're in that situation, you're like, mm, you're probably gonna get kicked. So I don't know, maybe kind of see where it goes. Hopefully not get shot in the back of the head, but... I was surprised to learn that our current militaries actually have trainings for handling pirates at sea. It makes sense, especially given the very real threat of pirates still today, but still surprising to learn. Would you do like Jenny and steal the pirate ship or like Jonathan and join them? Let me know what you'd do. And just for fun, while gathering answers for this podcast, Jenny had this suggestion. How about, um, funny pirate names generator? And put your name in there. So I entered my name in a pirate name generator, and you guys can now call me Captain Glennis Ropeburn. Arr. Thank you so much for joining me today on this fun rabbit hole at sea. And until next time, be safe, be kind, and stay curious, mateys. The Welcome to Wonderland podcast is copyrighted by Amy Bland and is part of Big Media. This podcast is recorded at the podcast studio at GOT Sound Studio in Lexington, South Carolina, but this episode was recorded in the Welcome to Wonderland recording closet. Any thoughts or opinions expressed as part of this production are those of the hostess unless otherwise indicated. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Please follow, like, and share this podcast. Find us on Facebook at Welcome to Wonderland the podcast and on X, the app formerly known as Twitter at Wonderland underscore pod. Check out behind the scenes moments and other videos on TikTok at Wonderland Pod. And finally, check out pictures, additional information, and go further down the rabbit hole on our website at www.wtwlpod.com. To submit corrections, additional information, or requests for episodes, please email the host at welcome to Wonderland the Pod at gmail.com. Holy cow, I hope that's not right. That is so long. If this is long, I'm sorry, guys. The preceding podcast is a product of Big Media and copyright 2023, all rights reserved.